So hello everyone. I wish you a wonderful good afternoon here from Cologne, Germany. My name is Mark Hebeker and I uh, work at Maya and Vidorno Altios. For those who are new here today and don't know Maya and Vidorno yet, uh, we are known as a service provider for Indian in the past. In particular, we primarily supported companies from German speaking countries with their expansion plans to India. But since the beginning of this year, we have merged with the French company Altios International, which enables us now to support our customers to enter and expand in target markets all over the world, and not only India. With 32 own global offices and over 100 trusted partners um, all over the world, we are now the leading uh, service provider for internalization worldwide. I have the honor to guide you through this webinar today. This is uh, the last webinar of our Global Business Month. And uh, yes, at this point, I just want to thank you, everyone who attended. And uh, we were very pleased and with the delightful feedback so far. If there are still some open questions with regard also to other and uh, past webinars, um, or there is an interest in receiving the recordings or presentations, please feel free to contact us. So now for today, in this last webinar, we will examine the topic Latin America, key factors for your success in Brazil and Mexico, correctly assessing opportunities and risk. So before we begin, a little bit of uh, organizational matters. Um, if there are connection problems or other technical shortcomings, what can happen? You can dial in using one of these numbers here on the left and can continue to follow the webinar. Ah, sorry, I forgot to mention. Next slide, please, uh, Artur, you can switch quickly yes this is the slide um, so you will be muted during the webinar uh, if you have any questions please feel free to write them in the question box on the right um, if there is a question that cannot be answered due to a lack of time or you prefer to get this question answered privately please feel free to write me an email after the webinar the webinar will also be recorded and if you wish we can send you the recordings afterwards the same goes for the presentation as already mentioned so next slide, please. Yes, so today we will approach this webinar slightly different uh, than our last webinars. We have four experts here today, uh, who I will introduce in a second. But instead of presentations and Q&A round at the end of the webinar, we have prepared questions for our attendees and hope that these questions will lead to a, to a lively discussion on several topics uh, regarding the Latin American market. This gives you, our audience, also the chance to, to be directly involved in the discussion by adding questions in the question box, which will then directly flow into the discussion. So please do not hesitate and share your thoughts and questions. So before we start the discussion, um, we will begin with a quick introduction of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Didier Koch, who is the Managing Director of our office in Brazil, and Mrs. Margot Lustalon, who is in charge of the Altios office in Mexico. After that, we will jump right into the discussion round. We have two further experts on the Latin American markets here today with us. Uh, Mr. Klaus Hepp, who is working as a managing director of Vulcan do Brazil Limited, which is a Brazilian subsidiary of the Vulcan Group. And Mr. Orlando Banquero, who is working as a general manager for the Latin American Verein, uh, which is the LAV, LAV in short. So um, yes, and they will also attend the discussion and share their experiences and perceptions on the market with us. We have more than 100 attendees here today. I'm very excited and it's great to have you all here. So, and now I will clear the stage for my colleague, Mr. Didier Koch. Good morning from Sao Paulo. Good morning. Didier Koch from Altos Brazil. Uh, we have been established in Brazil for 15 years, helping foreign companies, European companies, to grow in the Brazilian market. Uh, I'm going to present you a short presentation of Brazil and the current situation regarding COVID and the economy. Next uh, slide, please. So this is a COVID situation in Brazil. The situation is improving. 49% of the Brazilian population is fully vaccinated. Actually, yesterday we have reached 50% of the Brazilian population. And the number of cases is decreasing dramatically. You can see the numbers, the number of cases per week and number of deaths per week. And um, we have around between 10 and 12,000 cases per day of uh, COVID. 
and around uh, 350 uh, deaths per week. Please keep in mind that we are a big country. We are almost 210,000 people. So the situation is improving, and I would say that everything is open in Brazil. Companies, bars, restaurants, hotels, Brazil is working normally. Next slide, please. Some information regarding Brazil, country profile. Uh, Brazil was the world's fourth largest destination for FDI foreign investment in 2019. It's a good point. Population around 207 million, 70 cities, 17 cities, uh, with more than 1 million person inhabitants, Sao Paulo, Rio, Brasilia, Belo Horizonte, etc. Uh, GDP growth, uh, 1.4% in 2019, less 4% in 2020, and the estimate for 2021 is around plus 4.7, plus 5%. So Brazil is recovering from the COVID uh, pandemic. Inflation rate, extremely high, more than 10% for this year, unemployment rate still high, almost 15%. Foreign exchange rate, one euro is 6.30 Brazilian real. Before the pandemic, it was around 4.80, which means a devaluation of around 25% of the currency compared to 2020. And uh, please always keep in mind that Brazil has a really a diversified economy. Here in Brazil, we produce cars, we produce aircraft, buses, shoes, textiles, food and beverage, iron commodities, cosmetics, medical devices, machinery and equipment. So Brazil really has a, a diversified economy. Next slide, please. The main changes in Brazil during the last five years. Uh, Brazil is getting more and more modern. It takes time, of course, but we are uh, seeing some good changes in Brazil. Um, for instance, a new labor law voted in 2017, more flexible and more modern. Until 2017, the labor law in Brazil was very old. It was uh, of 1943, and the uh, labor law hadn't changed since 1943. So this is a good point, uh, a new labor law, which is really more flexible, more modern, and uh, more adapted to the necessities of the modern economy. Another example, a pension reform in 2020, until 2020, there was no minimum age for retirement. And this is new in Brazil. Now there is a minimum age. Keep in mind that the Brazilian begin working very, uh, uh, very young, sometimes 14, 15 years old. So they could retire very young at 50 years old. This is not possible any longer. So there is a minimum age uh, for retirement, which is essential to be able to finance uh, the pensions in Brazil. Uh, a new law in 2019, economic freedom law, which means basically less bureaucracy. Less bureaucracy doesn't mean that there is no bureaucracy any longer. There is bureaucracy still, but less bureaucracy, which means that you can get some authorization quicker than uh, a few years ago, uh, some uh, authorization for your company. And in preparation, but probably after the election next year, a tax reform that has been already voted by the parliament, but not by the Senate. And uh, that we think that it will be approved within around one year or one year and years. There is a tax reform to merge sales taxes. We have no VAT in Brazil. We have ISS, Pisco fees, ICMS, IP taxes. It's complex and everything would be merged in a, a one sole and unique uh, sales taxes VAT. It is in preparation and probably within one and a half years and two years. 
So Brazil is changing and getting more and more modern. Next slide, please. I think so the last, last one. Mexico. Thank you, Didier. Hi, everybody. Very nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm Margot Lustalon. I'm the managing director of Altius Mexico. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I have been living in Mexico for 12 years and I've been working with mid cap companies for the past almost 10 years. Uh, next slide, please. I will, uh, I wanted to, to present first the general situation in Mexico. As for Brazil, the sanitary situation is now under control. We have uh, almost 65% of uh, Mexico's adult population that has uh, received already a vaccine against COVID. Uh, Mexico has always been open to travelers. There is no need to uh, provide any negative PCR test or quarantine in, uh, when you came to come to Mexico. Uh, since uh, the beginning of this week, all the country is in a green light. Uh, two years ago, Mexico uh, established a, a system of lights like red, orange, yellow, and green, uh, respective to COVID situation. So now offices are mostly open, but the majority are still working from home. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, in this in this uh, map, you can appreciate that all the country is in green. So it's a very good uh, news for um, the business. Uh, until uh, last uh, Sunday, we still had some uh, part of Mexico that were uh, yellow. Uh, from now, we had uh, more than three million cases of COVID, and uh, it's uh, decreasing uh, as we speak. Next slide, please. To, to speak a little bit about uh, Mexico and an overview of the, the economy, uh, it's a market of 130 million customers. Uh, Mexico has a free trade agreements with 46 countries. Uh, the, the principal one is with uh, North America and Canada, and there is also a big one with uh, European Union. Uh, we have a very strategic location have it with an easy access to uh, the North America and Central America and South uh, American markets. It's the second largest economy in, in LATAM and we have also uh, a little bit uh, big hubs uh, like it's the first uh, fine tech hub in LATAM, uh, the third exporter of IT services in the world and we are uh, producing a lot of cars, exporting cars and, uh, and medical devices. Is there is a lot of opportunities in Mexico in every sector, but these are the main uh, the main sectors that I wanted to mention before uh, starting with the, the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mogu and TT. Thank you. Um, yes. So before we jump into the discussion, Mr. Manquero and Mr. Hep, can you please also uh, just introduce yourself quickly as well? Thank you. Thank you very much, much Mark. Yeah, I'm Orlando Oquero. I am the managing director of the Latin American Association. The Latin American Association is a non-for-profit non organization in Germany created more than 100 years ago to keep and strengthen the bindings between Germany and, and Latin America. We work, our members are mostly German or Latin American companies who has ties to each other, want to change each other's. And so that's what we do. We bring Latin America closer to German companies and build a very, very large network of companies with interest in Latin America. I myself, I was born in Colombia, lived many years in Mexico, many years in Peru, many years in Brazil, and of course in Colombia and in Germany. So I have quite an insight of what is happening in all the countries and I'm more than glad to share it with you today. Klaus. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very much Latin America Association, Altios and Maya Viduano for the, the invitation to this very interesting event. Uh, I'm German, I have 35 years of industrial experience uh, internationally 
And of these 25, uh, 35 years, I have been uh, working as managing director for German companies in the last 20 years. Uh, I've been doing this in Spain, but I've also lived six years and worked in, in Mexico. And I'm uh, living in Brazil and working uh, in more than 50 years now. Today, I'm uh, managing director of the German mid-sized company Vulcan. Uh, Vulcan is global market and technology leader with uh, components for power transmission for marine applications. We, the Brazilians, are responsible within our company for uh, our industrial business and I'm responsible from out of Sao Paulo for all Latin America means uh, Mexico, Central America, Caribbean and all South America. And in a side function, I'm also responsible for Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, all right. This was it for the introduction. And uh, now we start with the discussion. So the first question, the main question maybe as well, um, for you and Margot and, and Didier, you can start, maybe give us an impression. Uh, Brazil or Mexico? Uh, what are the differences between both markets for European companies? Well, Mark, uh, Brazil is a huge country, a huge economy. Here, it's an expensive country. We have an expression here in Brazil. We say Custo Brasil. Custo Brasil means uh, Brazil cost. Brazil is an expensive country because in Brazil, uh, taxation is uh, expensive, logistics uh, is expensive, lawyer, legal formalities, energy. So uh, may, uh, most companies do not go to Brazil to produce cheap and then to export. Usually they go to Brazil for the internal market, B2B or B2C because it's a large economy, so we have 207 million inhabitants, but I have explained we have also a diversified economy, which means that there are many opportunities also in B2B, machinery and equipment, uh, for agriculture, for manufacturing companies, and so on. So uh, basically, this is the main characteristic, in my opinion, of Brazil. Um, an expensive country, so you go to Brazil for the internal market, but usually you do not go to produce cheap and export. Brazil is not low cost. Margot? Oh, we can't hear you. M microphone. Okay. I think, uh, thank you, Didier. I'm sorry for all this. Uh, yes, Mexico is a little bit different because it's also a huge market. Uh, not that huge as uh, Brazil, but a uh, huge market. And uh, it's a pro uh, it is uh, for this, his localization, uh, pro uh, the proximity to large markets as the, the North American market and the Central American market. Um, so you, you come to Mexico to produce, uh, to reduce uh, manufacturing costs because we have one of the lowest cost of labor in the world, uh, as many German companies, Volkswagen, Audi, Mercedes, uh, that, that choose Mexico to, uh, to come and produce uh, cheaper and uh, export. We have also highly skilled workers. That is uh, very interesting and important because you will find all the, the workers you need for your uh, industrial production uh, and it can be cheap. Uh, we have also um, a very strong relation with uh, Europe. And uh, for example, Germany represents the fifth country in foreign investment in Mexico. And the uh, European Union is the second. So uh, in Mexico, we, uh, Mexico are very fond of uh, European people, European companies, and know how to receive them well. Uh, we have um, um, the, the, the Euro European Union, was the third largest source of import in 2020 uh, after un the United States and China. And we import ma machinery and appliance, chemical products, tr transport equipment, and base metals. So uh, maybe to, uh, to resume, uh, the US economy recovery have boosted the Mexican economy 
even through the Mexican policy during the pandemic wasn't fa favorable for companies, but we are uh, going in a good direction again. And uh, yes, the very uh, the biggest difference between uh, Brazil and Mexico is is this one. As said uh, Didier before, we c you come to Mexico to produce cheap and uh, to sell to the Mexican market, but uh, but also to export. Uh, Mexico have uh, 46 uh, uh, free trade agreements with uh, different countries, so we 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 have this uh, these qualities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. This gives us a, a great first impression. Um, so, Mr. Hepp, maybe you can add now. Um, you have lived and worked in Brazil for a total of 15 years, and uh, in between, you also li lived and worked in Mexico for for six years. What experience can you share with us um, comparing these two countries as managing directors of successful German companies in these two countries as well? Yeah, uh, Mark, I think there is not a single answer. Uh, it always uh, depends on, on what exactly is the, the business of the company, what is the target market for the company before you can say maybe Mexico is a better location or Brazil. I mean, uh, I must uh, remind you that for good reasons, 1,200 German companies have decided to settle in Brazil. And for sure, uh, in most cases, for good reasons. On the other side, uh, as already mentioned, uh, Mexico is a magnet uh, in the last 20 years, especially for companies, and many of them in the automotive uh, industry, which supply the North American markets mainly from out of Mexico besides the Mexican market. So we don't, like always, it depends. Uh, in Brazil, we have high cost for, for lots of things, but on the other side, we have a highly industrialized company with market for many things. So uh, I can only say it really must be investigated individually before a company should take its decision, what is the better place, yeah? And for sure, it also depends a little bit. If you want to export to the United States, uh, for sure, Mexico is a much smarter uh, solution than Brazil. But if your market may be the Andes region plus Brazil, then Brazil might be the better one. So, like always, it depends. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually received the first questions, but before we go there, I uh, I want to ask you, Mr. Banquero, um, I know we're specifically talking mainly about the markets Brazil and in Mexico today, but can you give us also some input about uh, interesting markets in Latin America, like uh, Colombia, Chile, and Peru, for example? Um, sure, of course. Obviously, obviously, uh, Brazil and, and Mexico are, are the main business countries in the region, so uh, it should be a focus on both of, of those countries. Uh, but there are other opportunities in other countries, which probably could be a mix of the opportunities you have in Brazil and the opportunities you have in, in, in Mexico. Colombia has been a country which has have all over the time a positive uh, economic growth. Only two years in this history has been a negative growth. So Colombia is obviously a very interesting place. If we see that the Venezuelan economy has to be recovered someday, we don't know when, but someday which should be rebuilt again. So the place to be is Colombia. It's very interesting. Uh, Peru has its own own typical forces there. So if you are in mining, if you are in, 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 in agricultural products, Peru could be a great place. It's stable, has one of the most free economies in, in the region. So anything which is with money is very, very easy. Convertibility of the, of the you can pay even in the country in US dollars. So it's very easy. And Chile has been until now, one of the safest places. Obviously, is the country with the most free trade agreements of the whole region. So, also an entry for Asia. It's a great country to be in in, in Chile. As as Klaus had mentioned, it depends a lot how your business is is uh, built up. What is your strategy? I just want to comment what what did you say? Obviously, Brazil is a high cost country, but it has also very high burden to import stuff. So sometimes the higher cost compensate the even complicated, more complicated, and even very, very high cost of import goods. 
So sometimes the decision is not I could produce cheaper somewhere else. I could not sell sometimes in Brazil if I'm not there. So this also also have to be contemplated in the idea. And obviously, both countries are part of the free trade zones or agreements, which are being in Brazil, you have the whole Mercosur as a kind of kind of internal market. So you can easily or more easily uh, make businesses with the other Mercosur countries, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina. And being in Mexico obviously gives you the all the benefits of the Alianza del Pacifico so that you can use Colombia, Peru, and Chile also as a market, which is make it very, very easy. So it depends on your strategy, which is the best, which is what you want to do. Uh, and all has their, as it's been said, all has their benefits. It should be before going there, really look into it. What is the best option? Be prepared, go visit and have good people around you that help you take the decisions. Thank you. Um, okay, maybe uh, Mr. Hepp, maybe Mr. Hepp, there's one question. Um, what prompted Vulcan um, to set up and run its Latin American business entirely from Brazil uh, uh, with branches in Mexico and in Colombia um, to manage it from there? In our case, uh, the, the decision was because in Brazil, since four decades, we have turned into one of the, the main players with the supply of our components for the mining and steel industry and many other industries. So we have uh, a lot of experience and, and, and competence concentrated already and we manufacture all products in Brazil. And it was uh, a clear logical decision uh, years ago to say, why not go into similar markets for our products like mining in Chile, in Peru, in Colombia and in Mexico. And uh, when we uh, analyzed the whole market region in Latin America, we came to the conclusion that alone because of the long distance between Sao Paulo and Mexico City, which is the same like Sao Paulo and Frankfurt or Mexico City and Frankfurt, uh, if you want to do business, uh, you have to be there. And uh, in the Andes region, in the end, we decided to go to Colombia because as Orlando explained, uh, uh, Colombia is a, is a quite stable politically and economically country and Colombia has the big advantage for us that it has uh, a, a quite diversified industry and economy as well. So uh, we decided to do Peru, Ecuador and Bolivia together with Colombia from out of Colombia and it, we, we are quite happy with this. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is from our audience um, and then they are working in the machinery business in, in Germany and uh, they try for four years now uh, to launch your, their business in Mexico with sales partners. The problem is that basically the customers need financial support to invest. Is there experience in this issue? Um, I just put this question out here. Maybe someone wants to pick it up. <laughs> I can, I can, oh, Margot. Please. Yes, yes, go ahead. I will go after. Yeah. Okay, we, we have seen, obviously, if, if you compare how European companies invest in Latin America and you compare it with Chinese, you have a total different financing model behind it. Obviously, Europe, because of the rule, cannot finance it openly all kind of investment in companies you do. And we know uh, the, the bottleneck of financing are always the small tickets. So if you need a, a financing from zero to five million or a bit less, it becomes difficult. For tickets beyond, it's not so complicated. You have the development banks, you have a lot of cooperation, there, there is more management. But small tickets is always very, very difficult. This is something we have been seeing. And normally, especially for German companies, all they have, they call house bank, the home bank. And normally the house bank in Germany are small savings agency, Sparkassen, this kind of, of banks who has not that large international experience. So I always give the advice to go to the cooperation banks, DAG, to go to KFW, to go to the bigger ones, see what is possible there 
and sometimes there you can get the financing. But small tickets, it, it's really true, it's not that easy. And the difference locally, you have a, a much higher interest rates. So that's what you have to, have to analyze. Obviously, you have inflation there that can compensate your, your, your higher rates, but that is something you have to analyze. And sometimes subsidiary are not that financed or capitalized that they can ask for credits. So sometimes you have to look for combination of a European financing with a local financing, and there the Landesbanken in Germany are a quite good option. Yes, just to just to uh, to say something else, uh, Orlando. What Orlando said is uh, perfectly right. Uh, it's very expensive to finance a project in Mexico. So yes, the recommendation would be to to find also a financiation. Uh, outside Mexico and maybe a small part in Mexico and to work with uh, distributors and partners in Mexico can be also uh, complicated if you don't have someone to animate the relationship in Mexico. So maybe you can uh, work with both the financial part and also the commercial activity in Mexico to uh, stimulate your distributors to sell more and, uh, and be there. Uh, yes, because if you leave it to, the, to them, it's, uh, it's uh, highly probable that it will not uh, match the objectives you have. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, okay. Yeah, this, this leads us to or the other option that you have to open up your own subsidiary. Uh, the question here now is, as to Mexico, to start a company, is it still required to, to have two companies, one to hire personnel, one for, uh, for other activities, uh, for the activities? Um, no, uh, it's it's not. Uh, it's uh, the Mexican companies used to do that, but just this year, um, this year there there were a big reform, and now it's uh, it's forbidden. So you need to have just one company that has the employees and generate uh, revenue. It was to uh, because in Mexico you need to uh, to share your revenue, a part of your revenue at the end of the year with the employees. That's why uh, the Mexican style until uh, 2021 was to have different companies to, uh, to share the less. But uh, yeah, it's not possible anymore. So you need to have just one company. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So the next one is for Brazil. I know, DJ, you were, you were waiting for your, <laughs> your next moment. So the next one is uh, after uh, attending, the, the, this, this uh, question is also from, from an attendee. Um, he was attending events like the FCC, the FWC, the OG, and um, Brazil is suffering economically these last five years, uh, was his perception. So what will be the prevision for the near future, let's say the next two years uh, in general, and for which industry specifically? Uh, Brazil began to face uh, an economic crisis in 2015. 2015 was difficult, 2016, 17, and it uh, began to get better uh, in end of 2017, beginning of 2018. There was a strong economic crisis. Uh, for what reason? Uh, you know, if you want to um, forecast the evolution of the Brazilian economy, look at the price of the commodities. Because Brazil is a, a huge exporter of commodities. Uh, coffee, soya, uh, iron, uh, etc. And uh, one of the reasons, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons of the economic crisis from 2015 to 2018 is that the price of the commodities in the world went down. Uh, and if you look at the statistics of the last 20 years, you can really see that there is a correlation between the price of the commodities in Chicago, in London, and uh, also the uh, economic growth in Brazil. In Brazil. So uh, we know that today the price of the of the commodities are increasing. Uh, all prices are increasing: pepper, coffee, soya, wheat, everything. So uh, 
there is a quite a, a, a high probability that uh, in this post-COVID world that Brazil could take advantage of uh, this uh, uh, price of commodities and face uh, a growth. It's quite likely. Still, at the same time, we have internal problems. We have political problems and we have a strong inflation, uh, which is not in favor of a strong economic growth. So it's extremely, of course, difficult to answer this question. But if the price of the commodities continues to grow, there is no reason why Brazil should not grow. And same thing from the price for the foreign exchange rate. Um, the balance of payments is balanced, and more and more US dollars are entering Brazil because exports of soya, oil, and so on. So there is also a probability that the Brazilian real should value should increase. The only problem is that we have the Brazil internal problems, the political problems, and until now it has been, um, let's just say, a break. It has been an obstacle for the economy to grow and the currency also, the, the Brazilian real to, uh, uh, to, to increase. Okay, thank you very much. Um... If anyone wants to add, feel free. Yeah, that's it's always like an option, just like uh, in general. Um, um, yes. shortly, shortly. I, I probably agree with you there. I think also it's positive, but it's really depending. And uh, normally we see uh, in these both countries we are discussing about if America, the North American economy facing any problem, it immediately reflects on Mexico. And now in the case of the commodities, we are seeing that the most importer of Brazilian commodities is China. So if we see there some kind of issues in the growth of the Chinese economy, it will not in the same impact in US to Mexico, but it will reflect immediately on, on Brazil. So these are quite risks. Obviously, we have in Brazil next year elections, which make everything a bit of question mark behind it. Uh, and this is something you always have to be aware of it, that the countries are not more standing full alone. So all the world economy is affecting Latin America right now heavily. So we have to always be carefully what is happening worldwide, not only in the country. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is a, a good bridge for also the next question. Uh, the Latin American region in general uh, is characterized by high political and also economic instability with often abruptly changing framework conditions. Um, yeah, how does a medium-sized German company does business successfully in the region cope with this? Um, is there a magic recipe or something, something like we can, uh, <laughs> we can, we can tell the audience? Mark, Mark, um, regarding Brazil, I don't know for Mexico, but uh, regarding Brazil, one of the problem is the evolution of the currency. It's a yo-yo. Before the pandemic. Um, around 4.70, 4.80 Brazilian reais for one euro, and today 6.30, 6.40. And um, 10 years ago, it was two reais for one euro. So, uh, in my opinion, one of the main difficulties, if you want to enter the Brazilian market, is really the foreign exchange rate. It's not stable. It can be 6.30 this week, 6 next week, and then 6.70, it's a yo -yo. And a way to, not to eliminate, but to mitigate this risk is, of course, to have a local content to produce locally. Of course, we know that the price of all commodities in the world are in US dollars. So um, even if you have a local content, the price of your raw materials, plastics, uh, uh, iron, steel, etc., is definitely in US dollars. But at least your local cost manpower is in Brazilian reais. And in this case, you can mitigate, which is 
in my opinion, one of the most risk when you want to go to Brazil, which is the evaluation of the Brazilian rail, this yo-yo. I can jump in. Um, in Mexico, maybe the, the main risk is, also, is the politic uh, situation. Uh, we, we had a change of uh, government in 2018, at the end of 2018, and it hasn't been very favorable for companies. But since we have, <coughs> sorry, since we have the, we have the American market, uh, North American market that near of Mexico, and the, the stability and the boost of the American economy, North American economy, will always um, will always uh, take Mexico in his uh, uh, in this opportunity to, to grow. So it can be mitigated that the political situation can be uncertain, but the the economy will still grow with uh, with uh, the United States. Mark, I think. Uh... Coming back to your original question, I think one, one of the important uh, reasons for companies to continue successful in a highly volatile environment like Latin America, where things always change, is you have to be flexible. You cannot do business in a region like Latin America if you want to follow a strict, predefined business plan. You have every morning you have to look in the newspaper, you have to look what's what's up, what's happening, what's and you have to adapt your company policy, your business policy uh, to the particular new situation. And the second point is uh, I think companies who have a mono business uh, are very dependent on that and they cannot substitute things by others. But companies like ours, who serve a lot of different customers and industries, have a, a certain natural protection. Because I think it's the same in Latin America, like in the industry in each of these countries. There is always some who are good and some who are bad. And what helps you to get through such situation is if you have a, a portfolio of different things. Yeah. If you have customers and industries which are doing well, while others are not so good. And the same if you serve markets in Latin America, which are maybe down during a certain period, but others are up. That's fantastic. And, and that's more or less uh, what our company uh, has experienced during the last 40 years in uh, Latin America. And that's what I know from many other German companies. Uh, as an experience. Uh, so you can say a little bit there's always market, but it's not always the same market. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. I, I will just add uh, exactly Latin America. It's something sometimes strange when I hear it's very unstable. At, at the end, Latin America has been, with some only few exceptions, all countries are democratic countries, all are rule based, are uh, all more or less are accepting also the OECD rules. So it's not that stable. The, the economic situation changes, some rule changes, and I see mostly what happens is that companies are not disciplined, disciplined in, enough. So you have to be really careful that your environment around you doesn't lead you to have a less fair attitude against business. So you have to be very very careful in what has happened. All these kind of risk you can manage. Currency risk is manageable. It's quite obviously it costs you something, but it's manageable. Also for political risk, you can take the insurance the German government is offering. Every time you do a, an investment in Latin America, you can use the guarantees of the, of, the, of the German government. So there are a lot of things you can do to kind of minimize those risks. On the other hand, this is really an, an appeal I do to all companies that are looking for the first time to Latin America. Don't go blind to something. Let you really guide. You need to have people who know it. And there are very good experts everywhere. You can find them and be, be there also before. Know what is happening. Otherwise, it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, nice words for the end. Um, just to to dig into this a little bit, like the LRV is helping as well with these situations. Um, 
what is the advantage for LAV members in, in, in doing business in the Latam region? Oh, there, there is a lot. I'm very glad to see that uh, both Maya Vidorno and, and, and Vulcan are members of the LAV. What we do, we are always not the experts. <laughs> we are a small team, but we have lots of members. And what we do a lot is share the experiences of one member to another, help, support them when their kind of decisions are needed. And obviously, you know, a hundred years ago when the association was found, the, the key factor was information because there was a lack of information. Today, uh, there are massive amounts of information. What we try is to sort it out, to clean it out, to, to really put what is really happening through and also share, but the most thing is share the experiences for others, support them, helping them, which member can support, which member can help, which experiences are there, and that's what we mainly do. We do a very big event, the Latin American Day, where we have tried to do is to keep Latin America on the focus of the German and European government so that it, there is no a lack of, of interest on in the region. It's going to be now the 4th and 5th of November here. The vice president of Colombia is coming. So this is this is mostly what we do. We try to help companies to build a very good network to support each other and helping find the people they need for counseling, support, etc. So that we need. We do not do it by ourselves because our members don't do it, but this is what we try. And I think for hundreds of people successfully. <laughs> Orlando said something very interesting, don't go blind. And uh, this is definitely true for Brazil. Um, Brazil is a complex country. And in Brazil, the law is one thing, but the common practice in many cases is another thing, which means that if you go to Brazil, of course, you need lawyers. It's uh, extremely important. But at the same time, you need to have a good network of specialist who knows the common practice in Brazil. Because if you go blind or if just you just go with lawyers and you know the law but you don't know the common practice, uh, then it will take time and you can make some mistakes. So you need really to work with good specialists. But for Brazil, at least I would say specialists in law, but also the common practice, how it works every day. Yeah, it's, it's the same in Mexico. It's always what, what we recommend. Yes, because you can ask three experts the same question and you will always have three different answers. So it's very, very important to uh, surround yourself with a lot of experts uh, that know the market and understanding it before coming to make a plan and adjust your offer, your products and your strategy to the Mexican market. Okay, thank you. So, um, yes, so now from the perspective of a member of the LAV, um, Altios maybe, um, the question is, are you also supporting German companies to find local agents and uh, uh, in, in, in Mexico and in Brazil? I think the answer is, is pretty... Yeah, we, we do not do the homework companies should do. So if you want to look for a business partner, you should know what you are looking for. We, we support companies giving them our members, they are already there. We work very, very closely with the German foreign chambers in the countries, which is another, and there are other experts uh, in the countries which can support. Yes. We do not do any kind of market analysis or looking for partners, so we do not do that, but we have an extended network and we should really find someone who could help. Exactly. This is where Altios comes into game. This is exactly uh, <laughs> what I wanted to... Yeah, yeah MNV Altios can perfectly do that uh, in Brazil and in Mexico, yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, yes, so uh, we, 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 we're approaching our last questions. So, um, in your opinion, I'm going to also put this question out there. Uh, um, what could be said about the stability and attractivity in, of investing in Paraguay? Um, to have a completely different market here. <laughs> I could not hear your question. Uh, what could be said about the stability and attractivity of investing in Paraguay? Paraguay. Okay, we saw that Mr. Mauricio Claver Carone, the president of the IDB, just a couple of weeks 
ago said that if he would be an investor, he would invest in Paraguay. <laughs> I don't know why exactly he said that, uh, but it's really true. Paraguay is a country incoming. There is a lot of, 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 of opportunities there. Obviously, it's a small country. It's a country where logistics is very complicated. You know, it has no, no shore, no ports. It's uh, just river ports. Uh, it has a very good stable and low uh, fiscal uh, duties, so it's a quite good investment. It has been stable. It has get a lot of money coming into the country because of people leaving Argenti Argentina, leaving uh, Chile. So there is a lot of money in the country, but it's still a small country. A lot has to be built. A lot has to be done. And logistic is a very complicated issue in Paraguay. So if you really need a lot of logistics, it's going to be complicated. Otherwise, it's a stable country and it has great uh, fiscal stability and opportunities. Paraguay can be interesting uh, if you want to conquer the Brazilian market. Actually, there are many Brazilian companies who are today producing in Paraguay because as I said, Brazil is not a low-cost country, but Paraguay is a low-cost country. And uh, hundreds of Brazilian companies, manufacturing companies, are now producing in Paraguay for the Brazilian market. Usually, uh, not for the whole Brazilian market, because Brazil is a huge country for the south of Brazil or southeast of Brazil, because uh, then it's close to Paraguay and logistic costs are expensive in Brazil. So if you want to conquer the, the Brazil market, the south of Brazil, it can make sense to be in Paraguay. If you want to go to the north of Brazil to sell your products uh, 3,000 kilometers far from Paraguay, then it, uh, it's not interesting because of the logistic cost of Brazil. But for Sao Paulo states, para Parana State, Santa Catarina, uh, it can make uh, it can make sense because the Paraguay belongs also to the uh, to the Mercosur. So there are no uh, no duties between Paraguay and Brazil, and the taxes are cheaper, energy is cheaper. Okay. And, uh, one of the main activities uh, of Paraguay for companies is that you practically uh, do not pay duties on importation of raw materials, which makes it extremely interesting for people who mainly do something like in former times in Mexico, maquila-like business, you know. You import materials, you put them together, you have manual operations. Uh, but it's a country which still is quite difficult for people who have a more complex uh, operation and who need uh, more skilled people. Because it's a small country and the availability of skilled people is not that hard. Okay. Okay, using our last five minutes properly, uh, we have one more question, which is a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, I guess they can answer it a little bit, um, extend your answer for this question. So. Latin America is always known for or linked with natural resources, um, first and second industry. How is Latin America improving in services and new industries? Um, what are the possibilities and maybe dangers? Uh, the key word here is economia uh, naranja. So, uh, yes, maybe um, I just want to put this out there as well. If so, I, I can start. So there is a, an amazing, an amazing scene and in, 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 uh, infrastructure for uh, startups. It is amazing what is ha happening in, in Latin America, uh, in all countries. Uh, obviously, the one who first saw it and started very, very heavily was Chile, with a policy of the state supporting innovations very, very strong. But if you see the, the number of unicorns coming from Brazil or from Argentina, it, it's amazing. So. There is really, really a lot. And also, besides this innovative and, and, and startup scene, uh, Latin America has not always been seen as a kind of services. People always look on trading of goods because it came from mining, it came from, from, from regulator, but services and tourism are increasing drastically. You see, Colombia, 10 years ago, there were almost no tourism because of the internal conflict. But now, before the pandemic, was the country with the largest increase on tourism. 
So there is a lot of things happening, uh, not only in the traditional um, branches, but still there, all the countries are still depending on these traditional branches. So we cannot say that this is, this is slowly changing, but there is a lot of opportunities in services, in tourism, in startups, in IT. So there is a lot of opportunities and the countries are taking that. Yeah, and also Mexico is a land of opportunities for um, for startups in the tech industry. And uh, as Olanda said, uh, we export a lot of services from Mexico to Europe. Uh, for example, business services, transport services, travel services, telecommunication, information services. So yes, Mexico wants to position itself as a hub for uh, tech uh, tech companies and uh, be the land of opportunities for startups also. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, uh, regarding Brazil, yes, of course, we depend a lot on commodities and natural products, of course. But, uh, for instance, uh, 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 Embraer is a Brazilian company and Embraer is the uh, uh, third largest producer of aircraft in the world. And this is a Brazilian technology. I'm not talking about a foreign technology. So uh, in Brazil, uh, with Brazilian technology, we produce aircraft, we produce medical devices, we produce cosmetics, etc. There is a Brazilian industry with Brazilian technology. And we have in Brazil also startup fintech and so on. So, at the same time, yes, we do depend on soya and uh, coffee and commodities, iron, etc. But at the same time, we produce uh, aircraft, we produce uh, medical devices, uh, we produce engines, uh, we produce buses, and all of this with Brazilian technologies, Brazilian companies. One last word, Mark, also. Uh, we all have here the hype of hydrogen and obviously we know if Europe will want to, to get to these goals they have set for CO for decarbonization and it will be not possible with the production of energy in Europe and obviously Latin America has a quite green energy grid a lot greener than Europe has and if there are very significant projects on hydrogen and really working very very good in countries like Chile, uh, Uruguay, Brazil, and Colombia. Uh, in, 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 in Mexico, there is from the private side also a lot of projects and interest on producing hydrogen. But this is also a key factor for the future that it can be become an export. It can be the new OPEC of the future if uh, hydrogen is, 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 is keeping that pace that it has right now. All right. Thank you very much. This is uh, also a very good timing. So now uh, we have one minute left. So yeah, at this point, thank you all for your uh, insightful full, uh, experiences that you shared with us and your perceptions on the markets. Um, I think, yeah, for my part, I enjoyed it a lot and uh, I hope our audience as well. So um, if there are any further questions, like I said, please feel free to, to contact us uh, after this webinar. And um, yes, this is it from our side today. So thank you all. And have a thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. I don't know how to get out.